Here we go. Quantities of motion. So here is the space shuttle. And here's a table of velocity of the space shuttle each second after takeoff. Each second after takeoff. This is a rough estimate. It's pretty close. This is pretty close to what the velocity of the space shuttle is <coughs> or was each second after takeoff. What do you notice? What do you notice about the velocity? The velocity is constant. Is that true? Is the velocity constant? Velocity is increasing, but what's constant? How much it's increasing by, right? How much is it increasing by every second? 30. It's going up by 30 every second. Okay, so I want you to predict the, or do a quick calculation here to figure out what the velocity will be at 5.7 seconds after takeoff. Go. Find, find the velocity 5.7 seconds after takeoff. However you can. Do it however you can. Good. How'd you do on this? Tell me what you did. Okay, and what do you think it would be at six seconds? 180, okay. And then? So, we, yeah, okay, so you took off a few. That's, that's the right idea. But so can we get something a little bit more accurate than that? Dakota? Okay. 5.7 times 30. All right, anyone do it? That's fine. That works. Anyone think of it a different way? Like looking at, say, looking at 5, right? 5, it's what? 150. So, okay, so 150 plus... 30 times 0 0.7. Okay, so do you recognize what that is right there? What is 30 times 0 0.7? Something we've talked, what is it? MDX. It's MDX, right? So what is 30? 30 is our, this is the constant rate of change of velocity, right? And then so you're taking that constant rate times a change in x. And that gives us what? A change in the change in velocity. Add that to the, the total accumulated velocity so far, and you get the final velocity, right? So that's that's very much aligned with what we what we talked about. Okay? All right, so we say the changes our velocity are accumulating by 30 meters per second each second. Or the acceleration of the shuttle is, shuttle is 30 meters per second each second. Say it again. Um, because I was thinking about interval, I was thinking, thinking in terms of intervals and previously accumulated amount plus a little more change. Like I was trying to okay. that that idea. But you're you're right. You're right. <clears throat> okay. So sketch a graph of the acceleration function for the rocket. Put acceleration on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. So we want the acceleration graph of the rocket. Acceleration on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. Who's done? Paris, what'd you do? Okay, all lines are straight, so you mean horizontal, right? Horizontal line. Okay. Yeah. So this is what you should have drawn, right? So this is just constant acceleration of 30 meters per second per second. <clears throat> okay, so t 
Tell the person next to you, what's the meaning of that constant rate of change? What's our, what's our good, broad, robust meaning for this constant rate? And then I want you to use that meaning to write a function for velocity of time t. We've kind of already done that. But so just practice. What's the meaning the broad, in the broadest sense? And write the velocity function. Go. Where is Mark? Mark here? Mark, tell me. What'd you say? OK, right. So given any change in time, the change in velocity is 30 times that change in time. So it's just something like that, given any change in time. So if we're worried about the change in time from 0, we can just call that t. right? So then what the velocity function is? Zane, what's the velocity function then? V of t is? OK. <laughs> so we said, given any change in time, though the meaning of the, the, the constant rate is given any change in time, the change in velocity is 30 times that change in time. So if you think of the change in time from 0, that's just t. right? So then what's our velocity at time t? So given any change in time, t, the velocity is 30 times the change in time, 30t. All right, now I want you to write that function again. I want you to write an alternate version of that, this time in a way that represents or expresses the velocity as the accumulation of tiny changes in velocity. So the current velocity as the accumulation of tiny changes in velocity. Go. So you're going to rewrite this function now, the same function, but you're going to rewrite it in a way that expresses it as the accumulation of tiny changes in velocity. Go. Jamie, did you get it? Here she goes. Jamie's going to do it. Ready? Zero to t. Thirty something else, right? So you say dx. Okay. So I'll say du. Okay. Or you could have written zero to t. We just want to be more general, more. Not a of t. What's that? Got it? All right, so this is consistent. So net change, right? We can express it as the accumulation of tiny changes, right? And that's our integral, our net accumulation function. Net accumulation function. OK? So I just want to point something out that, yeah, questions? Why did you, um, what is the matter if it's zero to x? Um, yeah, so x we usually save for the independent variable. But since we're having t here, so x is, you know, x is our x-axis independent variable. So yeah, you could have put x here, but normally x is like the independent variable. So what's that? Yeah, a little, just a little bit. Like normally, if you use x, it's the independent variable, and then things like t, u, v, we use for this this other variable inside the integral. It's just kind of convention. Is that the same question you had? No. Um, why is the, isn't a of t just the thirty t of x? No, a of u isn't thirty t. A of u is thirty. Oh. This is constant rate. So here, here's your here's your thirty. T, right? A little change in T. And then we're accumulating those over over the time. Yeah, so so this is what I was uh, this is what I was um, thinking we would write, but she said thirty, which is absolutely correct, because that's what A of U is. It's thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I want to distinguish so these are these are both the exact same function. They both give values of velocity at any value of t. But they're different, right? So this 
what we've been working on all in semester is what is this is called an open form open form it reflects process and meaning right it reflects the process we spent a whole week on the process behind this the whole first week of class we, we spent on the process behind this that if you have a changing rate of change right if you have a changing rate of change we need to break it up into little constant rates and then accumulate it by those constant rates right and so that that reflects this process it's open form so that's nice and that it shows it shows the meaning it shows the meaning of what's going on behind the scenes but what's the disadvantage to this say we want to get v of you know 8.2 if we have a changing rate, so something more complicated than 30, what's the disadvantage? Well, we gotta we gotta get out technology. We gotta get out GC in order to get, say, uh, V of 8.2. All right. So it doesn't. It it reflects process. It reflects what's going on. It reflects the meaning, but it doesn't allow us to get values of the dependent variable quickly and, and readily. So where does so that's where this comes in. This is called closed form. So, what does it? It doesn't. It doesn't have. It doesn't reflect this meaning. But what's its advantage? Easily generates values of the dependent variable. Right? Really, really easily va generates values of the dependent variable. That's why we like closed form. Okay. So. Open form reflects process, reflects meaning, reflects everything behind the scenes that got us to this net accumulation function. Okay, this then an equivalent form is you know standard a standard function, something that will generate results quickly and easily. Okay, so both are good, and we have to we have to we've been working all semester on writing these, and so then coming up soon in the course is given given open form. Can we write closed form? Because closed form is very <coughs> handy and convenient for generating lots of values quickly of the dependent variable. So that's where we're going next after we do a, a unit on uh, physics applications. We're going to start learning how to write closed forms given open form accumulation functions. How do we write them in closed form? So that's a preview of things to come. All right, but back to acceleration and velocity. Any questions on that open form versus closed form? All right, we're not going to do this. Okay, so I've got a All right. All right, I've got a couple of cars, they're acceleration functions. Acceleration functions. What's different about these accelerations compared to the space shuttle? So if we think of acceleration as a rate of change, the rate of change of velocity, these are these have changing, changing rate of change, right? Changing rate of change. But that doesn't phase us now, right? Because we, we know how we could get, we know how we could write uh, the velocity functions given a changing rate of change. That's, we've got the, the tool now. We paid our dues. We did the we did the heavy lifting in the first week, and so now changing rate of change functions doesn't affect us at all. So I have a few questions for you here about these two cars. Which car is moving faster at t equals 2.5 seconds? And justify your response. Which car is moving faster at 2.5 seconds, which is right here? And justify your response. Go talk to the person next to you. Everyone's talking to somebody. No, here we go. Is this Hannah here? Okay. So Hannah down here in front is going to talk about what they talked about. What did you guys say? Did, who's which car is moving faster at 2.5 seconds? Car one. Car one. Why? Okay. Okay, so good. So she said, you should have said car one. Car one is moving faster. It has a higher velocity. 
because in the first two seconds, what, it accumulated uh, change in velocity a lot faster than car two did. Why? Because it has a higher acceleration. And then, so now, after two seconds, what, car two is accumulating changes in velocity faster, but not enough to make up for the damage done in the first two, right? Not enough to, okay? So, next question. Does... Does car two ever come get to the same speed as car one? And if so, when do you think? All right. Does car cars car two's speed ever uh, reach car one speed? And if so, about when? Go. So just estimating about when. When do you think about when? Nathan. Probably just before six seconds. Just before six seconds. He's saying right around here. Did you say something similar or something different about the, about about there? Okay, so somewhere five, six, seven seconds. Is that what you came up with? Okay, so now we want to know exactly when. So how can we figure out? We've got this amazing tool, GC. How we want to figure out exactly when they have the same velocity for the first time? Accumulation of what? So we want the, we want the velocity functions, right? Yeah, but isn't that just the accumulation of No, it's the accumulation of changes in velocity, which we can calculate through acceleration. So it's not the accumulation of acceleration. It's the accumulation of small changes in velocity, which we each one we can calculate from acceleration. So yeah, you got the right idea for sure. Um, all right, so let's. Uh, we want the velocity functions, right? We need the velocity functions. So let's. How we can let's write those out. All right, so here I've called car one is acceleration a one of t. There's car, acceleration one, and there's uh, acceleration for car two is a sub two. So we want to do what? What's that? Um, okay, integral. So more specifically than integral. So what should I do? What's that? The rate of velocity? Acceleration is rate of change of velocity, right? So... What's that? Okay, careful. So that's the same thing. So it's not the accumulation of acceleration. It's the accumulation of changes in velocity yeah. using the acceleration. Okay, so yeah. So I, I know. So it, it's super close. And you're thinking you've got the right, exact right thought process. But be careful. We're not accumulating acceleration. We're accumulating small changes in velocity. And we can get those changes in velocity using acceleration. Yeah, we're gonna. Okay, let's define a function v sub one. Good. V sub one of t integral integral from zero to t of okay, which acceleration function? A sub 1 of T. So let's, let's, use, let's use something. Let's not use X. X. Yeah, so let's use U. X would be okay, but just X is normally we think of as an independent variable. We're using T as an independent variable now, so let's use something like U or V or something like that. Okay, so we got this function V1. Is it correct? Assuming that what? So there's an assumption we've made that at the starting starting speed was zero, that there was no no previously accumulated speed before we started the clock, so, and that's fine. Okay, and then also, so we'll do v two. Uh, 
And then, so that's going to be based on A2. And just for kicks here, we'll use W, something different. Okay. So now we got our two velocity functions, and we want to know when they're, the velocity is the same for the first time. What's the, well, the easiest way to do this? Graph these, right? So we're going to graph these now. So we're going to graph V1 and V2. And we're going to graph them in a new pane. So I'm going to use the apostrophes. So Y equals what? V1 of... Okay, we're graphing in GC now. So this is so... Remembering graph in GC... X and Y mean graphing on the axes, right? So we want X prime. And we'll make that one, uh, let's see. All right, and then the other one we're going to do is, same thing, graph V2. Okay, you're the man. T.A. Ben, save the day. All right. Monday recitation. Don't you wish Ben was your recitation later? <laughs> okay, so uh, here we go. So I graphed V1 and V2. I want you to tell me which is which. Which is which? Go, figure it out. Which one is V1 and which one is V2? Green or purple? <laughs> All right. And which one is car one? Green is car one. Purple is car two. And so now, when do there, when does uh, the speed of uh, car one reach the same as the speed of car two for the first time? Five point six. So Nathan said just before six. That was good. Good estimation of 5.6. Okay? And so this is where car one, or sorry, car two passes car one. Is that right? This is where car two passes car one at 5.6 seconds. Is that right? Okay, no, this is right, exactly. So if, if that didn't sound right to you, that's good. This is where they have the same speed for the first time. So, who is ahead right now? They're tied. No, we just said that. They're not, they're not tied. This is just where the speeds of the cars are the same for the first time. Who's ahead? Car one. So velocity is, is also a rate of change. Rate of change of? Displacement, right? Yeah, dis distance. Displacement, okay. And so who, which car has accumulated more changes in distance? In these first 5.67 seconds. Car 1. So it's ahead. It's way ahead. Okay, so when will they reach, when will car 2 catch up to car 1 for the first time? When will car 2 catch up to car 1? Or will, will it? Who thinks that car... Two will catch up to car one in these, what is this? Eight seconds. This is eight seconds. Who thinks that car two will catch up to car one? Who thinks that car two will not catch up to car one? How can we, what the rest of you, do you care? <laughs> <laughs> All right, how can we find out? How can we find out? 
We're going to come up with displacement functions or distance functions, which will be the uh, integral of velocity is the rate of change of distance or displacement. So we'll set up those. And I've already done that. All right, and so here I've done that. S1 is the accumulation of uh, little changes in distance calculated by the rate of change velocity. S2, same thing. And so I'm going to graph those. I'm going to graph those as they're defined in open form. Okay, they're defined in open form. So I'm going to graph those. So here's car one. I think car one was blue. Is that right? And car two is red. Now watch. Why can't we just see the graph? Why is it taking so long? It has to accumulate through not one, but two intervals. So for every little bit of accumulation to find a little bit of accumulation of distance, it's got to accumulate the whole accumulation of, of little change in the velocities. All right? Does car two ever catch up to car one? All right, so if you said no, good job, you were right. All right, now over here, I have closed forms. Now, they're, it's ugly, but it's closed. Here's the, here's the displacement for car one, okay? And then here's the displacement for car two, based on those acceleration functions. These would be the closed form version, right? Not integral now, but just elementary functions. Sine, cosine, polynomials. Now watch this. Ready? I'm going to graph this as closed forms. Ready? You see that? What happened? Instantaneous. Why? Closed form is super helpful, convenient, quick for generating values of the dependent variable. So it just could graph that every value, the whole graph in an instant, versus all the time it took using open form. 